So today the message is entitled 10 virgins, one problem, and the subtitle for today is the fire drill of last day events. Now most of you are aware of the coronavirus. It is the reason why we are actually doing service from Facebook rather than in person. And we do this precaution because it's very easy to spread infectious diseases. And whether that disease comes from a bacteria or from a virus, there are some basic things that help to protect you against this. So I wanted us to start out by actually talking about something that to me gives great glory to God, and that is your immune system. It's one of the most incredible systems that God has actually created on this earth. And so you have your immune system, and in your immune system, you have three basic layers of defense, three layers of defense. The first one is the physical or like the barrier. The physical barrier is like your skin. Your skin actually helps to protect you from uh, infections by just being a protective layer. It's actually incredibly effective. And so when any, anything foreign comes in, your skin actually has what's called uh, antimicrobial properties to it. So just similar to what you see on your container of soap that says uh, that it has antimicrobial stuff, your skin actually has that contained in it already. Uh, so your first line of defense is your skin. Now that also is true inside of your body because your gastrointestinal system also has walls through which only certain things are supposed to come. So the first layer is the barrier. The second layer of immunity that you have is what's called your innate immune system. Your innate immune system. Innate is a really easy word to know, in as in inside, innate as in born uh, is the word there. So these are your inborn immune system. This is what you are actually given from birth. Now, if you can see the slides up behind me in this little Venn diagram, it shows some of the cells that are involved with your innate immune system. The only thing you need to know about this is this is the immune system that you're born with. It's a process that you can actually inherit from your parents. It has cells that are in there that are able to eat all the bacteria, kind of like your white blood cells, and things that you're very familiar with. That is contained in your inborn immune system. And what's neat about that is that whatever your parents were immune to, you can also be born with that same immunity. So the second layer is the innate immune system, or your inborn immune system. Then you have your third layer, which is called your acquired or adaptive immune system. This is actually the part of your immune system that's capable of learning. It actually is created through experience. So just in case you fell asleep with those first three, you have your barrier, which is the outside protective layer that keeps stuff from getting in there. Then you have your innate immune system, once something gets in there that's able to uh, fight off anything that your parents were able to fight off. But then there's that third layer. It's the one that's live. Similar to how we're live right now on Facebook. This is the one that's live. It actually learns by everything that comes into it. Now what's so incredible about this is you have some like 24 cells, each one of them having four different functions, and they go in probably one of the most complex interactions you can possibly imagine. There's a couple of ones that you'll find to be very interesting. One of them is your natural killer cells. These ones actually will just eat anything that looks like it's not supposed to be there. They're actually so efficient at what they do, they'll even kill your own cells if they think they have cancer or something like that. Pretty incredible stuff. The second one that's really important is what's called your dendritic cell. Now this is kind of like the brain in the immune system. This part is able to go out there and detect what the bacteria is. And what it'll do is it'll rip the bacteria apart and then take the little pieces and put it all along the outside of itself so that your body remembers who the enemy is. Which if you're thinking about this, this is pretty cool. You actually have a part of your immune system that is capable of thinking and remembering. And this is the part that helps to get that process started. The next one you have is like your helper B cells, or your B cells, and these ones actually will tag all the bacteria with a bunch of antibodies. They will spread all these antibodies onto the cells so that they look like food to the, to the cells that go around doing the eating. Then perhaps one of my favorite ones is your helper T cells. And your helper T cells actually help the cells that are doing all the eating and all the fighting. It encourages them to keep going. So you actually have cells that encourage one another to keep moving forward. When I read all this, I thought, wow, this is really fascinating. It would be so awesome if we worked the way our immune system worked. And I, as a not so surprising detail here, I want to let you know that I think we do work a lot like how our immune system works. In fact, I believe that the 10 virgins, the wise ones, will play out all these characteristics. So I have up there as the best response to a crisis is preparation, being ready. And God has built this thing into our bodies to be ready. 
I believe he's also built this into his church so that she can be ready when the cry comes, when the crisis begins. So we're going to look at that three-pronged immune system that we talked about there, where we had the barrier, the innate, and the acquired. We're going to find out that this ties in directly with the ten virgins. So the ten virgins have the one problem. So we're going to look at what the barrier is. We're going to look at what the innate essentials, the inborn things that God gives us as basics to make sure that we can fight off what is coming. We're going to look at the one acquired need or the acquired needs that, uh, that, that help us to continue to develop when the fight changes on us or when it gets progressive. It's not something that we've seen before. And then we're going to look at the practical crisis response. How do we as Christians prepare ourselves for what is coming? So I pray that this will be a blessing to everyone here. All right, so we just read about the parable of the ten virgins. Now I want you to notice that this wedding happens in the evening. In the Jewish culture, it was not unusual for weddings to take place in the evening they would actually have several destinations that they would go on. The first place is that the, uh, that the bridegroom would go to his, uh, his bride's father's house, right? So he has to go there to bring her from her father's house and to transfer her from her father's house to this one. And so there would be, this procession could last days uh, for, for the wedding. And where Jesus puts us in is not in the destination where they're there to meet bride and the father of the bride. They are actually de uh, designated to meet the bridegroom, which means it's the final destination. You can see that second point up there. The ten virgins are there for the final destination in the wedding feast. Then, what's also fascinating about this is that they are the last ones to come. They are the last part of the bridal party to come, which means, if you will, they are the remnant of the bridal party. They are the remnant of the bridal party. All right, I hope everybody's catching how this applies to the last days. So this wedding happens at night. This is the final destination of the wedding, and the bridal party of the ten virgins are the remnant of the bridal party. The rest of the bridal party is already there. This is the remnant of the bridal party. So let's start with the barrier. The first part of the barrier, the first barrier that really protects us from the outside influences, from the darkness of this world, that infection of sin, uh, for those who, you know, join themselves to the body of Christ, is accepting the invitation. In Revelation chapter 22, in verse 17, it says, And the Spirit and the bride say, Come, and let him that heareth say, Come, and let him that is athirst, and whosoever will, let him take of the water of life. How? It says, Freely. I want you to notice that the first step to salvation is not something difficult. In fact, it really is not something where you do in your own strength. The first thing that's required is to listen to the invitation, accept the invitation to come, come to the wedding. And it even says there, I want you to notice in Revelation 22:17, if you could see that verse on the screen, it says that the spirit and the bride are saying come, and it says, let those who hear also say come. So part of accepting the invitation is extending it to others. And so we know that for these virgins, we know that at least for these first two steps that we're going to look at, that they've done this. These virgins would have obviously invited other people to come to the feast because they have a role and a part in it. And they obviously accepted the invitation, otherwise they wouldn't have a role or a part in it. All right, and then it says, let him who is a thirst come. So the next thing that's really required to accept the invitation is to realize that you're thirsty. Now, most of you realize that thirst is something that you can easily sense. You don't have to really do anything. It's just something your body naturally desires. And I want to say the same thing, that in this walk, in this world, it doesn't take us very long to realize that we need something or that something is wrong in this world and we need something better. And so simply to accept the invitation is to recognize that there is a better place to be and a better place to go. So the first step is to accept the invitation. We see this invitation show up uh, in different places, but accept the invitation. The second one is wedding garments. Obviously, these virgins were wearing something that would have distinguished them from the rest of the guests there, because otherwise you wouldn't really know the difference between them and a bunch of other ladies that were attending. So where do we get the garments? So wedding garments are a piece of this. This is found in Zechariah chapter 3 and verse 4. Speaking of Joshua the high priest, it says, And he answered and spake unto those that stood before him, Take away the filthy garments from him. So the first step there with the garments is taking away the filthy garments. Now, in Isaiah chapter 64, we are told that all our righteousness is as filthy rags or as filthy garments. The first thing we do is we allow Jesus to take away our sins. 
Continuing on here, it says, And unto him, behold, I have caused thine iniquity to pass from thee. So even right here in the text, it lets us know that taking away the filthy garments is taking away our sins. It's something that God does for us. This is that first barrier to the infection of sin and darkness in this world, is to allow Jesus to take away our sins. And then he says, And I will clothe you with change of raiment. So these garments are a gift from God. So in the first part of the barrier is accept the invitation. The second part of the barrier is to accept the wedding garments. The third part of the barrier is that they are part of the wedding. They are part of the wedding, um, the bridal party. In 1 Corinthians 12, verses 13 and 14, we learn this. It says, For by one spirit we were all baptized into one body, whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether bond or free, and have been all made to drink of one spirit, for the body is not one member but many. So Paul lets us know that we are baptized by one spirit into the body. To just say this in everyday English here, when we are baptized, we are brought into God's church. And so that is yet another protective barrier. Now, some of you who have been coming to church for a while, you realize that even just sometimes the act of coming to church actually becomes a protection against doing what, what, what the rest of the world does. I can tell you that even in my youth, even when I wasn't that serious about God, just being a part of a church and being involved with church was a protective factor for me as well. And so that becomes like that physical barrier that keeps us from getting infected with this world. So all ten virgins are doing a good job on this level. But what about that next level? We just looked at the barriers that help us not to be infected by this world, the garments that we receive, the membership within a church, and being baptized, and uh, allowing, accepting the invitation to come to the, the wedding. Those were the barriers. How about the innate stuff? How about the stuff that we're born with, uh, similar to just like how we saw in the immune system? Well, the first thing that we learn about these virgins is that they are virgins. In fact, this has some significance, um, but I want to show you really quickly what the Bible has to say about virgins and where we get that idea from. So one of them is going to be found in Lamentations chapter 2, but for those of you who have your Bibles, I want you to flip with me really quickly to Revelation chapter 14, and I want you to see where else you see a scene of virgins, and I want you to see how this ties into the last days. We are going to be looking at verse 4, and this is talking about the 144,000. Listen to what it says. These are they which were not defiled with women, for they are virgins. These are they which follow the Lamb whithersoever he goeth, and they were redeemed from among men, being the first fruits unto God and unto the Lamb. So this is like an inborn trait of everyone who has come to Christ, who has accepted the invitation, they immediately have that born-again experience, and they become, in the eyes of God, less virgins. Ones who have not been defiled with women, that's speaking of like some of the apostasies that go on out there, they are virgins. They are born again and they have received Christ. They follow him wherever he goes. Let's see what else the Bible has to say about virgins. In Lamentations chapter 2 and verse 13, it says, What thing shall I take to witness for thee? What thing shall I liken to thee, O daughter of Jerusalem? What shall I equal to thee, that I may comfort thee, O virgin daughter of Zion? For thy breach is great like the sea, and who can heal thee? Which I think that's really interesting, too, that it not only mentions her virginity, but the fact that she is in need of healing. But here it is that in the Old Testament, this reference to being a virgin daughter was also reference to being part of God's people. Let's see what it says in the New Testament about this same idea. And we're just going to take a look at a, a verse here that lets us know what is this symbol referring to when we talk about virginity. Is this something that we can understand as applying to God's people in these last days? Ephesians 5.25, it says, Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, that he might present it to himself, a glorious church, listen to this, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. And so the same idea of purity applies to the church. And so one of those first qualities that is pointed out here is this idea of being as virgins. What's the second quality that comes out? You can see it up here on the slide. This is the lamps. All ten virgins have the lamps. What do these lamps represent? In Proverbs chapter 6 and verse 23, we read, For the commandment is a lamp, and the law a light, and reproofs of instruction are the way of life. So notice this here. It says in Proverbs chapter 6 and verse 23 that the commandment is a lamp, which means that these ten virgins have the commandments of God. 
Now, if you're hearing all this, it just makes a lot of sense. We know that these, uh, that these virgins are not insincere Christians. They have to be sincere Christians because they actually have the commandments. They've been born again. They've accepted the invitation. They have accepted those barriers that protect them from the darkness of this world. What about the light? In 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 6, it says, For God who commanded light to shine out of darkness hath shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Now, just in case you missed that here, the Bible compares light, not the lamp itself, but the light itself, to a knowledge of God. To the knowledge of God, as it showed in the face of Jesus. And so we know that all ten of these virgins not only have uh, that purity of character, or that purity where they're not being defiled by the things of this world, or at least not being defiled by the other doctrines and things that are out there, but we also know that they also have lamps, which is like the commandment. Uh, in Psalm um, 119, 105, it says that thy, thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. And now we're looking at the fact that the light itself represents a knowledge of God. And so all ten of these versions have a knowledge of God. All right. Let's take a look at this next one. What else is said about the light? In Matthew chapter 5 and verse 14, he says, Ye are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hid. And so we understand that we ourselves are supposed to be as lights, and these virgins all had lights, which when you, if you were reading through that parable, you notice that all of them had lamps that were burning. Just the problem toward the end was that some of their lamps were going out. They all had light at some point, but toward the end, when they're faced with this new darkness, some of them don't have what it takes for that light to keep shining. And we want to find out what that is, but let's start with what they did have of going right. So we are called to be a light in the world. Okay? There's also the vessels. You notice that uh, they had oil that was supposed to be in these vessels. What are these vessels? We can find out from 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 7. It says, but we have this treasure in earthen vessels that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. And so now the next thing we see here is that God has given us these vessels, and the purpose of these vessels is to hold a particular treasure. Now, in the parable, we know that that treasure was the oil. So let's look at one other verse that talks about the vessels as well before we get to the oil. He says, Marvel not that I say unto thee that thou must be born again, that you must be born again. The wind blows where it listeth, and thou hearest the sound thereof, but canst not tell whither it cometh and whither it goeth. So is everyone that is born of the Spirit. And so we are those vessels. That wind is represented the spirit, but we are the vessels through which that wind is supposed to work. So let's look at the oil here. I want you to notice in this verse, it's really nice how this is laid out. What is that oil? First Samuel chapter 16 and verse 13, it says, Then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brethren. And, look at the next words there, the spirit of the Lord came upon David from that day forward. So Samuel rose and went to Ramah. Notice that the horn of oil and the anointing of David immediately corresponded to the outpouring of God's Spirit upon David. So when the oil was poured upon David, the Spirit was poured upon David, meaning that the oil and the Spirit are synonymous. Notice that the same theme happens with Jesus in Acts chapter 10 and verse 38. It says how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost. Now normally people were anointed with oil, but here it says that Jesus was anointed with the Holy Ghost. And so again, there is an equivalence between the Holy Ghost and the oil. And it says, the, with the Holy Ghost and with power. And he went out doing good, healing them that were oppressed of the devil, for God was with him. And so at some point, all of these virgins had God with them. They had some measure of God's spirit. They were out there doing good things. That's why he tells us that we are to be called the light of the world. What are some of the other innate things that we're automatically given? They were virgins. They received lamps. They had light. They had vessels, and then they also had oil, like we just saw. Those are the innate essentials. And similar to like what we had talked about with the immune system, you have some basic things that you inherit immediately from birth that help you to be able to fight off diseases. And this is what we are immediately given as soon as we make a commitment to follow God. These are the things that we're given. We're given that purity. We're given the word of God. We're given the, the light to shine into this world. We're given vessels by which we can receive the oil, and we immediately receive the influence of God's spirit. So where does this break down? Let's take a look at that. This is the acquired experience. Now you'll notice there on this little shot that I have here that you have what's called your adaptive immunity. I want you to notice that up there it also says this is your slow response system. This is the part that takes time to get to. Now you'll notice that one of the big crises in the whole parable of the ten virgins 
is that they ran out of oil, and when they needed oil, they did not have enough time to go get it. Okay? So the problem of darkness comes in, but they're unprepared for it. And so they're told to go and buy oil. And if you, if you read through the story, what it says is that they go and try to acquire the oil, but the time it takes to get it causes them to miss out. It's too late. And so if you want your adaptive immunity to be built up, that takes time. And if you want to have the time, then you have to prepare while there's still time left. So don't miss that. If you want to have an immune system that's able to have this acquired immunity, that's able to fight the new stuff that comes, you have to give it time. You have to act exercise the system so that it's ready to go. Now, some other things that I wanted to point out here is that uh, there's this CD4 plus T cell, like you don't have to memorize all this stuff, but that one becomes really important because that CD4 T cell, that one right there, is actually designed to help the other cells keep fighting. Very interesting, it, like it doesn't actually do the fighting itself. What it does is it goes around keeping the other ones going because what happens is these other cells are working so hard that they actually get exhausted and if they get too exhausted, they'll just die. And so you actually, in this adaptive immunity system, on this part that's acquired, they learn to be helpers. They learn to help people keep going. And this is not something that you're just able to do overnight. You, in order to actually help someone, by the way, you actually have to know what you're doing, right? Like if you're going to be an effective teacher, you gotta learn the subject ahead of time. You can't just teach somebody something that you yourself don't know. You have to know your stuff. And for these CD4 cells, it seems to be what they do, and it seems to be part of our own acquired experience. Let's just look, take a quick look at this infection of darkness. This particular infection of darkness is different than the previous one. In fact, if you want to follow along, probably the best thing to do is to stay in Matthew chapter 25, as I'm making so many references to it, it'll just be helpful to know exactly where we are. So in Matthew chapter 25, I want you to note what time of day the bridegroom, the call from the bridegroom comes. In verse 6, it says, and at midnight. Now, do you all know the difference between midnight and all the other times of night? In theory, midnight is the darkest time. That's why it is called midnight. It's about as far away from the sun having gone down as it is away from the sun coming back up again. It's literally the middle of the night where it is at its peak darkness. And this is where the ten virgins come in, is when the world is at its darkest. We know this will be at the end of time. Jesus said that as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be at the coming of the Son of Man. As it was in the days of Lot, so shall it be in the days when the Son of Man cometh. We know that it will be a dark time. Now this is what the scripture has to say about darkness. And the command that's given to us during this time. This is found in Isaiah chapter 60, verses 1 through 3. It says, Arise, shine, for thy light is come, and the glory of the Lord is risen upon thee. For behold, darkness shall cover the earth. And listen to that next one. It says, and gross darkness the people. The word for gross darkness is like a thick, almost overwhelming darkness. So you have to have a light that is able to sustain not just the regular, typical darkness where there's a little bit of light in the background, but a complete and total darkness. But the Lord shall arise upon thee, and his glory shall be seen upon thee, and the Gentiles shall come to thy light, and kings to the brightness of thy rise. Now this is probably one of the best parts of it. It says that if you will allow this acquired experience to happen for you, will you allow the light of God to actually shine upon you, and people can actually see the glory of God upon you, then you will actually draw people to God. Something else to note here is that back in Matthew chapter 25, in verse 5, it says, While the bridegroom tarried, they all slumbered and slept. Now, part of the reason they fell asleep is because no one was coming. And perhaps this is a, an experience that most people can relate to in church. We've really reached a point in history where no one is coming. I mean, right now, it's kind of funny because I'm standing in front of an empty congregation, and that's uh, more ironic than, uh, than not. But literally, we're running into a place where, there, where our churches are dying off. And it's very easy just to fall asleep because no one is coming. But it is at this particular time that the wise and the foolish are distinguished. Now, I want to just submit something to you that's really difficult to prove from the text, but I think you can figure out intuitively that the way in which the foolish virgins are sleeping is different from the way in which the wise virgins are sleeping. And at a minimum, at least what's different about it is that only one of them, only one half of this group, is prepared for what is coming. 
one is able to rest because they made all the necessary preparations. The other one is sleeping carelessly. The other one is resting because it's not time yet. And they've made the necessary preparations to be ready in these last days. So what does it mean to give glory to God? You're all familiar with the three angels' message, and if you aren't, you find that in uh, Revelation chapter 14, uh, verses uh, 6 and 7, where, uh, where we are told to fear God and to give glory to him. For the hour of his judgment has come. This is the time in which we are to give glory to God. You might be asking, well, how do you do that? Whether therefore ye eat or drink or whatsoever ye do, do all to the glory of God. That's 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 31. Whatever we do, whether we're eating or drinking, do all to the glory of God. So this is the other part of that preparation experience, is that the people who will be acquiring the necessary experience in these last days will make sure that even if they're just eating, or whatever it is that they're drinking, is something that brings glory to God. And I'll let you use your own common sense about what kind of eating and what kind of drinking actually brings glory to God and what kind does not. But it should be relatively obvious to you that not everything out there should be eaten or drunk, drunk in order to give glory to God. Like, you know, I'm thinking about edibles. That's probably not going to help you give much glory to God if you're eating one of those because it changes and alters your behavior and way of thinking. And whatever we eat or drink should be something that we can set as a worthy example. In your immune system, the way this works is that even the foods that you eat make a difference in whether or not your body can really fight things off. If you're eating foods that are not healthy, your body will actually get caught up in fighting against food and trying to help you survive whatever you ate rather than being able to fight off the real invaders and the real infections uh, in the body. It actually preoccupies your immune system with things that aren't helpful. So God actually tells us to eat and drink to his glory. How else are we supposed to glorify God with our bodies? This is found in 1 Corinthians chapter 6. And this is going to be looking at verse 19. It says, What know you not that your body is a temple of the Holy Ghost, referring to those vessels again, which is in you, which you have of God, and ye are not your own? For ye are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. The second thing that these folks do to glorify God, other than monitoring what they eat and drink so that it's to God's glory, is they also just make sure that, they're, that they are aware that they do not own themselves. They belong to someone higher. All right, hope everybody's making sense out of this so far. Unfortunately, since I can't see your faces, I can't tell uh, how much of this is landing in the right space, but I, I pray that it is. Numbers chapter 21, verses 7 through 9, continuing with this acquired experience. This one will be interesting to you. Um, up here on the screen, you can see uh, a bunch of cells, and they're all doing, they're all doing fancy things. But uh, up there at the top, there's a little picture of a bacteria, and on the outside of it, there's what's called... Um, like what they refer to as antigens. There are these parts of the cell on the outside that help the, uh, the cells that are going out there trying to kill the infection know what they're looking for. So as I mentioned before, what they will do is they will tear the cell apart and then they will take the outsides of that cell and put it on the outside of themselves so that anything else that sees these knows how to identify them in the future. It's really kind of an interesting thing. It's like holding up body parts, kind of gruesome, uh, <laughs> to show everybody this is the enemy. Now, did you know the Bible actually says something about holding up the enemy so that you know who to fight and that you know where the problem is and that somehow this results in healing? This is probably one of the most interesting um, parallels that I've seen in Scripture, and this is found in Numbers chapter 21, verse 7 through 9. You tell me if you see the parallel as well. It says, Therefore the people came to Moses. This is after they had sinned. They were complaining about the manna. They got tired of eating this stuff that perhaps was to the glory of God. Uh, that they got tired of eating this stuff and they complained. And then God allowed these fiery serpents to go out there and bite and poison them. So it says, Therefore the people came to Moses and said, We have sinned, for we have spoken against the Lord and against thee. Pray unto the Lord that he may take away the serpents from us. And Moses prayed for the people. Now, I want you to notice what God told him to do. And the Lord said to Moses, Make thee a fiery serpent, and set it upon a pole, and it shall come to pass that everyone that is bitten, when he looketh upon it, shall live. Now this is really fascinating, because what you do is, he says, okay, what you want to do is you want to take something that looks like the enemy, which is a serpent, and you want to hold it up on a pole so everybody knows what the problem is. And somehow, by beholding what the problem is, everyone is changed and is cured. Hmm. That's exactly how it works inside your body. As soon as the enemy is identified, then all the other cells know exactly who to fight, and that helps to eradicate the actual disease that's in the body. And in fact, after that happens, this is why you don't get infected by the same cold twice. Because as soon as it gets in there, your body has what's called a memory T cells, a memory B cells, and they're like, hey, I know who this is, and they kill it immediately. The serpent has no power over those who have seen the serpent on the pole. 
All right, hope everybody's following that. Makes a lot of sense to everyone. Acquired immunity. So those who learn to look and live will have the same experience. In fact, Jesus ties us back to himself. Jesus is actually the example to which we look. Now we're going to go from metaphor to the real thing. It says, and as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. When you exalt the picture of Jesus, then you actually have an example of how you defeat the serpent. If you ever want to know how to resist temptation, go look at how Jesus fought against him. You can find that in Matthew chapter 4. You see how to resist temptation, how to defeat the serpent. And if you commit those things to memory, just like how your immune system does, then whenever those attacks come, you eliminate them immediately. They don't poison you. This is the acquired experience of the wise virgins. They learn how to fight the serpent so that when the temptation comes, they're not overwhelmed. The foolish virgins are totally overwhelmed because they do not have the acquired experience. I wish I could see faces to make sure everybody understands. But look at the example of Jesus so that you'll live. This is exactly how your body works. This is precisely how the body of Christ should also work. And I don't think it's irony that we are called the body of Christ because there are so many things that God has built into the human body that perfectly reflect how the body of Christ is supposed to operate. Look and live. Second part of the acquired experience, looking at that in more detail, is to know him personally. Turn from your Bibles really quickly to John chapter 17. John 17 and verse 3. And it says, And this is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. The other part of this acquired experience is getting to know Jesus. Now, we learned in the very beginning there that one of the protective barriers is accepting the invitation and that we automatically are accepted into the bridal party, that we have this role with Jesus. But that's not the same as knowing him personally. In fact, I believe part of the reason why the wise virgins knew to carry extra oil is because they knew something about the bridegroom. And in fact, for all of you who are reading this parable, if you actually commit these things to heart and memory, you'll know that just before Jesus comes, there'll be an extra weight that doesn't seem like it's supposed to happen. But if you know him, then you know that God gets there seemingly late. This actually happened with Lazarus as well, that Jesus uh, waited four extra days before he came and, uh, and rose Lazarus from the dead. This happened with the flood with Noah that the day that Noah went into the ark was not the day that the rain came. There was a delay of seven days. In fact, you can look all throughout Scripture, and delay is a common theme, which means we should expect that delay will happen again. If you're reading your Bibles and you're getting to know Jesus, you know that Jesus delays his coming. This is consistent all the way throughout Scripture. Jesus speaking again of himself, it says, Jesus saith unto him, speaking to Philip, Have I been so long time with you, and hast thou, yet hast thou not known me, Philip? He that hath seen me hath seen the Father. How sayest then, show us the Father? Look to Jesus, and you will know the Father, and you will know the Son, from whom we have eternal life, just like what we read in John 17, 3. There's another verse that talks about how we get to know him. It says, Henceforth I call you not servants, for the servant knoweth not what his Lord doeth. But I have called you friends, for all things that I have heard of my Father I have made known unto you. Jesus keeps no secrets from us. If there's something we don't know about Jesus, it's not because he didn't tell us. Oftentimes it's because we weren't listening. Get to know him, study his word, learn what he says, so you'll be ready to see him. Third thing here, examine yourselves. Examine yourselves. You never learn who the wise and foolish virgins are until the crisis hits. All the way through the story, all of them look the same. It's not until a crisis hits that you get to know who they really are. And so it is with yourself. We can tell ourselves all kinds of things about how we're good Christians and how we're sincere people, but you don't know until you put it to the test. Now, I used this example last time, but right now, as we're going through this whole uh, crisis in our nation and really globally, it's actually revealing some things about our own characters. I mean, how many people have seen people maybe not act the same way that they maybe would have acted now that the grocery stores are running out of stuff? Are we changing because of the economic problems that we're going through? The best time to get to know yourself is not when everything is going right. It's actually in a crisis that people reveal the most about themselves. Because it's easy to be nice to people as long as they have what they need. And I don't think it's a point of irony that the, that the countries in which are, have the highest rates of like atheism and, and disbelief in God are the same ones that have their cups filled to the brim. 
you'll find that in co countries where they're poor and they are confronted with necessity and they're confronted with the things that really matter in life, that they actually do tend to believe in God more than people who are allowed to be concerned about what's happening on Facebook. Although this is an exception. I hope you're all concerned about this. But people who get concerned about whether or not their cell phone has all the right features on it, these folks who are concerned about artificial things are less likely to be, believe in God than people who are concerned about real things, like people who are starving or dealing with disease and pestilence and all these other things. These things actually serve to help us to see what is in our hearts and to find out what's real to us. So here's what Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 13 and verse 5. He says, examine yourselves whether you be in the faith. Prove your own selves. Know you not your own selves, how that Jesus Christ is in you, except you be reprobates? Put yourself to the test. Don't lie to yourself. Don't just make statements, but find out who you really are. Paul says it again in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 12 through 13. It says, Now if any man build upon this foundation, speaking of the foundation of who he is and the gospel that he's come to believe, if anyone build upon this foundation, gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble, every man shall be made manifest. Now listen to this. It says, For the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire, and the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. But this idea of fire is the idea that you will be tested. Everything that you make a statement about will be put to the test. So what Paul encourages us to do is to put it to the test now while you can still do something about it. Don't wait until you hear the cry or wait until the crisis is there to try to do something about it. What's required takes time to develop. Start now. Examine yourself. In Hebrews chapter 5, verses 12 through 14, he speaks of the, uh, where God's people are supposed to be at and where they aren't. And he actually uses language that points to what we were talking about before, like there's the things that you're naturally born with, but over time you get better so that you can handle more. It says, for when the time you ought to be teachers, you have need that one teach you again, which be the first principles of the oracles of God, and, and are become such as have need of milk and not of strong meat. Let me just break that down really quickly for you. What, in what stage in life do we live off of milk? It's an in infancy, right? When we're first born, we have the ability from birth to digest milk, mother's milk particularly, not just any old milk, mother's milk. We, we have the ability to digest milk. But being able to eat meat, and they're referring to, to um, more coarse foods, that is something that is acquired through time, development, and experience. And he said, that you have become such that still need the baby stuff. And God tells us that we shouldn't, in these last days, be people who still require baby stuff, where people are having to teach us, but we should be in the place to begin teaching ourselves. Now, for those of you who are new to the church, look, continue to grow and develop just as God is leading you. But for those of us who've been here for a while, one of the things that he says is that you all should be teachers by now. And so if you ever really want to test your faith, or test to see where you are at in your faith, and you've been here for a while, See if you're capable of teaching somebody some of these things, because the very moment you try to teach somebody what it is that you believe, you will find out very quickly where all the holes are. But when you are put in a position to teach, that will show you how much you really know. Immediately show you how much you really know. And so he wanted them to develop and become those who are in need of meat. Now, I want you to see this. Now, one of the things that you can do to help, help yourself become a teacher is to study. But I want you to see what Paul adds in here as a necessary component to being a teacher. It says, for everyone that uses milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness. That is, that anyone that just only can be taught and can't learn for themselves is somebody who's become unskillful in the word of righteousness. It says, for he is a babe. He's got that inborn stuff. But strong meat belongeth to them that are of full age, that's maturity, even those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. Now, I want you to notice that there. That last part is so important. It is those who not only have studied the word, but live by it. You cannot exercise by just reading about exercise. I can read about running and I can read about all this other stuff, but that's not exercise. I actually have to get out there and put my feet on the track or on the pavement or wherever it is I'm trying to run and actually put the thing to use. Then I can actually make use of it. And so here it says that they put it to use. They have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. So again, if you're thinking about this whole immune system, it's because they've been through this stuff before and they made use of it that now they can benefit from its use in the future. So when you examine yourselves, study the word, exercise, and live out the word, and you will begin to have the necessary experience that all of us need in these last days. So what about the crisis? How do we respond to the crisis? Brothers and sisters, I believe now is the time, while it is still day, walk while you still have the light, 
for the night cometh when no man can work. This is, uh, you can find these in various places in the Bible, such as uh, John chapter 12. Now is the time to wake up. What's so awesome about everything that's going on right now, I mean, this whole virus thing is terrible and the economic effects, I mean, I definitely pray for people who are being impacted by this adversity, but one of the things that I believe is so awesome about this particular experience is it's like a test run. This is like a fire drill. Now look, whatever your opinions are about uh, the coronavirus and whether or not you think it's lethal, I still think it's best to avoid you know, being around and getting in contact with people and possibly getting them ill to the point of death. I think that's the, the, common, the, the kind thing to do is to avoid doing that to people. But that's not the part that I'm really focused on right now. What I'm focused on right now is how quickly this whole nation and this whole world has changed. I mean, here it is that we went from one Sabbath where everybody was here at church to another Sabbath where there's literally four people and you're watching this online. That is a rapid change. We've gone from having grocery stores stocked with food to having grocery stores that are missing all kinds of things that are several aisles and, and there's no real knowing when it's gonna be completely restocked. We've gone from having a booming uh, economic uh, system to one that is just, just crashing all over the place. This is the fastest drops in stocks that we've ever seen, ever, period. And all of this stuff has happened within this, the course of just a couple of weeks. This is how quickly a crisis can fall upon us. Now, I don't particularly believe that this is the crisis. I mean, it very well could be, but I don't believe that it is, which means that right now it's almost kind of like a pseudo midnight cry. It's like right now you hear this cry and there's an opportunity to prepare your oil. Now, you could go back to sleep. Like all of us have the option to go back to sleep, but brothers and sisters, why do that? Like, this is one of the coolest things ever is like, you know, Maybe some of you have had one of those days like you woke up and you realized that you had an exam the next day. And you're like, oh my gosh, I wish I would have known this because I would have studied more. Now let's just say that when that exam came, you found out a day before the exam that, oh, there's going to be this exam. You study, 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 and you know that you really don't have this information and you try to just swallow up as much as you can and then you find out the next day the exam is canceled until next week. Now you have a couple of options. You can wait again until you're one day away from the exam, or you can use that entire week to get yourself ready for the test. And brothers and sisters, Paul is very adamant about how we should deal with this. It's found in 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 2. It says, For he saith, I have heard thee in a time accepted. In the day of salvation have I succored thee. Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. Right now. If there were ever a time to get ready, it is not when the real crisis comes. Use this as a test run. Use this fire drill as a moment and an opportunity to actually get yourselves ready. Time is the great test. Brothers and sisters, we are told in Revelation chapter 10 that there is coming a point where there will be time no longer. I believe that refers to prophetic time. You can get into a Bible study about that, but there is coming a time where we won't know when Jesus is coming. I don't believe there's any definite time that tells us exactly when Jesus is going to come. But Jesus told us that time would be the test that shows what we're made out of. Now, we talked about crises that test your faith. I want to let you know that time is the greatest test to one's faith. Here's the parable that Jesus gives in Luke chapter 12, verses 42 through 46. And the Lord said, who then is a faithful and wise steward? Emphasis on the word there, wise. If you ever want to know what made the virgins wise, you can find out right here. It says, whom his Lord shall make ruler over his house. Now listen, here's the job of the wise servant. To give them their portion of meat in due season. The wise servants know when it's time to give meat in due season. Now we already learned that those who are able to make use of meat are those who have their senses exercised by studying the word of God. Those who put into practice what God has said. It also says the wise servants are paying attention to the people around them, which means they give people what they need when they need it. These are helpful people. And just like what we learned about the whole immune system, there are parts of the immune system that give people encouragement to help them keep going. If you ever want to be God's best friend, help the least of these. If you want to be God's best friend, help the people around you. That is what is going to make your light shine. When everyone else is being selfish and everyone else is trying to make sure that they get what they need, be the people who are looking out for others. God calls that a wise servant. Blessed is that servant, continue on the verse, whom his Lord, when he cometh, shall find so doing. These are the people who are ready. In the parable, it said it was oil. In reality, it is, are you working for Jesus today? Are you looking out for those around you? Are you teaching the gospel? Are you helping and ministering to the people's needs around you? Are you giving people their mute in due season? 
which means you don't just throw stuff at people just because you have it. You give stuff to people when they need it. It's not talking about enabling people. This is talking about really helping people when it's time to do so. I pray this is making sense to everyone so far. Continuing on with the parable, it says, Of a truth I say unto you that he will make him ruler over all that he hath, but if that servant say in his heart, My Lord delays his coming, which means that word there, delay, is time. When the time begins to tick, this is when you'll begin to see the difference between the wise and the foolish. So the foolish will begin to say that the Lord has delayed his coming, and it says he shall begin, or he shall begin to beat the men servants and maidens, and to eat and drink and to be drunken. Instead of helping those around him, he attacks those around him. And this stuff happens in the church. It certainly happens in politics where people are more concerned with being right and more concerned with proving something and beating somebody up over what they believe and what they don't believe than they are about actually helping them. And it says to eat and drink and to be drunken, which means he just acts like the rest of the world. He's not eating and drinking to the glory of God. He's eating and drinking to satisfy his own needs. He's not eating and drinking to the glory of God, but he's doing so to become drunk, to become intoxicated, to just fuzz out from all the things that are going on in the world. Now, look, you can get drunk with alcohol, but you can also get drunk with technology and all kinds of other stuff. There's lots of ways to keep yourself completely inebriated and completely tuned out to what's going on around you. And all of this happens because of the apparent delay. As I said in the beginning, people can become disenchanted because no one else is coming to the church, so they decide to stay home because the church isn't powerful enough, so I'm just going to stay home, or I'm going to go invent a whole new denomination on my own because we're going to find out what the real problem is with the church. And they go around attacking people, telling them that you know, unless they you know, eat more carrots, then they're not going to make it to heaven. There's all kinds of ways to get yourself intoxicated with the foolish things of this world rather than doing what God has called us to do. And it's all in response to seeing the Lord delay his coming. But those who are wise stay in the church, in the, in the place that God has called them to be, and they seek to help those around them. The Lord of that servant will come in a day when he looketh not for him, in an hour when he is not aware. And it says, it will cut him asunder and will appoint him his portion with the unbelievers. Now this is the, the part that's so interesting here. Your immune system knows when there's something wrong with its own cells. One of the things it will do is it will test it and it will actually look inside of the cell and figure out there's a specific kind of protein, by the way, that's inside the cell. When they see that that protein is not responding correctly, it knows immediately there's something wrong with that cell, and it will treat its own cells like foreigners, which is fascinating because at the end of the parable, remember what Jesus said to the ten virgins? He says, I don't know you. And part of the reason he doesn't know them is because they've become infected with something other than what God has given them. To put this even into more perspective here, remember that these ten virgins, five, the five foolish ones, they actually went out and bought oil. Now, I want you to just be thinking critically here for just a second. The oil that they were given was the oil of the Holy Spirit, right? But what kind of oil can you get after the Lord has already come, after probation has already closed? What kind of oil is going to be available to you? Do you think God's going to continue to give out his Holy Spirit to people who really weren't prepared for him and really weren't trying to get ready? What kind of oil would it be? Counterfeit. Counterfeit oil. You can find that in Revelation chapter 16 where it talks about there were three unclean spirits like frogs that came out of the mouth of the beast, out of the mouth of the dragon, out of the mouth of the false prophet. There will be false spirits that go out into this world that will try to take the place of the Holy Spirit, but it's the wrong spirit. And guess what? When those virgins show up with the wrong spirit, the master of the house, who is Jesus, will know you're not a part of my body. You may have been at some point, but something inside of you has become defective and you don't belong anymore. That's got to be one of the harshest things that you can possibly hear is to follow God all your life and then at the very end mess it all up. But there's no reason to do so. Now you notice that there were 10 virgins, which means there's a 50-50 chance of being one of the wise and one of the foolish. Now you can eliminate your odds. Now you can, you can, you can keep those odds by flipping the coin, right? But if I told you like, hey, if you hand me this coin heads up, then I will give you $1 million. And if you give me this coin heads down, then you will go to prison for 25 years. Now, you have two ways that you can deliver this coin to me. You can flip it and then hand it to me and then hope that by chance you land it on the right spot. Or you can turn it. You can examine the coin and make sure that it's facing the right way before you hand it to me. Now, which one of these classes would you want to be a part of? What's really awesome about this is that really the, it's not the statistics that are 50-50. It's the choices that are 50-50. It's A or B. Will you be wise or will you be foolish? And you can choose today. 
Here is the appeal of Jesus. And when he preached this message, it says that he cried when he spoke this message. It doesn't mean that he was weeping, but it means that he lifted up his voice about as loud as he can get it so that everybody can hear that it's not his desire for any to perish. God does not want foolish virgins. He wants all of you to be wise. And he tells you exactly how to do it. This is John 7 and verse 37. It says, in the last day, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried saying, if any man thirsts, let him come unto me and drink. And so there's actually a secondary invitation that comes here. Not just the invitation to come to Jesus and to follow him and to have that barrier of protection, not just to uh, stay with the, uh, that natural response that when you come to Jesus, like, you know, you become a part of his church and you experience his purity, but to go on to this next level where you can actually partake of the water of life that comes from Jesus himself, partake of his Holy Spirit, become more like him in character, experience that perfection of Christian character. And he cries to the people to come to him and drink. Prepare today to meet him. So we looked at the barrier, which we explained already. It's that first layer of defense that is automatically given to everyone who accepts the invitation, accepts the garments, and accepts the role to which they are called. We found that there's innate essentials, which God gives to us in the beginning, which is that light and the lamp, the word of God, all the things that are needed to continue on with the Christian life. But once you've been equipped with these things, it's your job to put them to use. And that is where the acquired need comes in. We have to make use of these things to become teachers, to mature, to become more like Christ in character. And then our practical crisis response, brothers and sisters, is exactly what we said from the beginning, and that is to prepare. Now is the acceptable time. If it's your desire to prepare for the Lord's return, to be immune to the darkness that is coming into this world, to do more than just simply accept Jesus, but to also be a part of this, this bridal party that is, whose job it is to invite people to come to Jesus, then I would just invite you to pray with me just now. Our Father in heaven, we have gone through a lot of information, a lot of material, and I know we haven't been able to talk to one another, but I pray that your words today have been clear, that you have provided all that is needed for salvation. And I thank you so much that the beginning steps to salvation are so incredibly easy. We just simply need to accept and receive what you've given us. But help us, Lord, not to stop there, because there is a delay that is coming. Help us to prepare today for that crisis, Lord, so that when this darkness comes in the world, we would not only be immune to that darkness coming inside of us, but we would have a positive light to push back into this world. That we would be able to shine when everyone else is terrified and is concerned about themselves, which this is only the tip of the iceberg. This is not even the major crisis. Lord, help us today to be immune to the things of darkness and help us rather to shine with the light of heaven. We accept this light from you. We accept your offer for, your, for the Holy Spirit and we commit ourselves to exercise the very gifts that you've given us. And I pray that you bless everyone listening today, Lord, that you would fill their houses with your spirit and help them, Lord, to be able to invite others to follow you. And I just ask for these gifts in the precious name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Again, we want to thank you for joining us for our live streaming uh, service today. If you have comments, thoughts about this, feel free to post. Uh, we'll make sure to also record and put this, uh, put this up on the, um, on the church website as well as on the Facebook page so that if anybody wants to go back and, uh, and check these out, you'll let us know. Please leave any comments or uh, questions that you have so that we know how to prepare for the next service. God bless you all and happy Sabbath to you.